rompe con. Much more tight 
and much more special and much more unique in its niche. I'll give you another example. I was recently a judge for an independent game award. It's called the D-Infinity Independent Game Awards. And we saw many different entries, including three complete role-playing games. Now, two of these games, they didn't really impress me very much because they said, you can do anything. This is a game where you can do anything. And I'm like, great. What does that mean? What does it mean for a game that I can do anything? That doesn't... Why should I play this game where I can do anything as opposed to another game where I can do anything? But there was a third game that really stood out and it was amazing because it had an essence and it had an experience to communicate to me that was very specific and very unique. That game was called Baker Street. And the essence of Baker Street, what Baker Street was about was playing detectives in Victorian London. And it nailed it. I mean, absolutely nailed it, right? So if I want to play a game where I have the experience of being a detective in London, I know the game I'm going to go for. Not the one that says I can play anything. Just pointing that out. So you have the essence. You also want to think about the core activity. So let's say we know what our game is about. Let's say, I don't know. Um, you, sir. What is our game about? Just take something, anything. Um, trading on a river. River traders. Okay, great. So we're river traders. And that is the essence of our game. We want to trade, we want to make money, right? Okay? So the core activity is going to be a combination of factors that help us bring this experience out. I like to say there's an XYZ format here. We are X doing Y despite Z. And what it is, this is a context so that you as the player of the game, you understand who you are, what you're doing, and why. Halo says you are a space marine fighting the covenant despite all the dangers of the, uh, the Halo world. Right? That's its XYZ. If, we are, if we're traitors, the X is we are traitors. We are doing what? The Y is the verb. We're making money. We're seeking adventure. We are we're river traders. What are we doing? Um, is, is profit the goal? Because profit can be the goal. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it's, it's a rather simple one. I like I okay. to figure out something more complicated if I can. Okay, so we're making profit. What is the thing that we have to struggle against to make this happen? Are there uh, other traders? Is the river a really dangerous environment? Uh, is there some kind of uh, black market that we have to deal with? I kind of like a black market idea. Okay, so maybe there's like an organized cartel or somebody who's trying to stop us from actively making money as river traders. So that would be our Z, that's the conflict. And conflict is really important, I'm gonna get to that in a second. But we are the traders making profit despite the efforts of the black market. So this tells us the identity of our game. This tells us what we're trying to build. And the better an idea you have of exactly what you want your game to be, the better a game it's going to be. Now, there is a third leg to this, and we'll get to that in a second. It's gameplay. And that's going to be your mechanics, your how you roll dice, you know, whether it's a first-person shooter or a turn-based strategy game, right? That's that's another leg of this. That's part of the experience. But you'd be surprised how many people I go to and they say, "I have a game I want to tell you about." Great, let's hear it. What what is your game about? Well, you can really do anything you want because you lost me. What's your game about? Uh, a good friend of mine is John Wick. He created a game called. Legend of Five Rings. And if you ask John Wick what Legend of Five Rings is about, he's going to say it's about honor. A very simple concept. It's actually a pretty strong idea, though. And he weaves it through everything. He weaves it through all of the mechanics. He weaves it through the core activity. He weaves it into the adventures that you run in Legend of Five Rings. The card game even has mechanics for honor. Because 
that's what that game is about. And it has a very strong identity because of that. If you want to role play as samurai, there's really only one choice in the marketplace. Unless I want to use the game that says I can do anything, and I really don't. <laughs> because I would rather play the game that's really about that thing. Now, there's, not, there's nothing actually wrong with creating a game that can do anything. Nothing wrong with it at all. There are some really fantastic games out there. In fact, I work for a company called Pinnacle Entertainment Group, and they make a game called Savage Worlds. And Savage Worlds is a universal system. You can use Savage Worlds to do anything. But what they did really smart is they not only provided this framework, they also said, here are some settings. Has anybody heard of Deadlands? Yeah. Some people in the back have heard of Deadlands. It's this awesome mashup of horror and Wild West. Boom. And if you want to play an awesome horror Wild West game, absolutely do Deadlands. And Savage Worlds is the engine that runs in, uh, Deadlands, and there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. So please don't walk out from this panel going, I can't do a universal game. Oh, he said it was wrong. No, it's not wrong. It's not wrong. But it's, it's a different type of philosophy, and really the marketplace is really tough on those types of games. You have to have something you can do with the game. That's the core activities. What do we do? Right? Why, if, if, we, if I have a game of Tetris, okay, I forgot about that earlier. What do you do in Tetris? You solve the puzzles, okay? And you solve the puzzles quickly because it speeds up. That's the gameplay aspect of it. The mechanic, it speeds up over time and it's more challenging. It's harder to complete the puzzles. But that game is about completing puzzles. And by God, it really does a good job of that too. So anyway, um, so we have an idea of our core activity, we have an idea of the essence, we have an idea of the gameplay. That is the real start of coming up with the game. Now obviously gameplay is going to differ based on what kind of game it is. A card game has completely different mechanics and a completely different way of delivering the experience than a tabletop game, than a board game, etc. As a game designer, if you want to know more about gameplay, you should play board games study different types of games because there are a lot of different ways to interact with any genre you can pick. Uh, if you pick card games, there's cooperative, there's competitive, there's deck builders, there's trading card games, living card games, and, you know, poker, and, <laughs> you know, even more simpler stuff like war. But there's still things that you can learn from playing those types of games if you want to be a card game designer. Okay? Uh, basically, I mean, I, I could go on for hours about the different types of mechanics there are, so I'm not really going to waste your time with that. If you have uh, a question about an individual type of mechanic, don't hesitate to ask, and there will be time for questions. Um, but basically, your gameplay, and this is where I was coming from, your gameplay should support the experience. Okay, unless you're, unless you're making Minecraft where it's all about, like, the gameplay, like, this is I build things with rocks. <laughs> you know, that's Minecraft. Unless you're making Minecraft, you need to have this built into all of it. So, in our game of river traders, right, it's about trading on the river. My gameplay mechanics, I would want to have some way of tracking profit. I would want to have some way of indicating how much attention the black market is paying to my operations. I would want to have some kind of mechanics for a ship, for creating a river. I would want to make sure all those things are there. And again, you'd really be surprised how many games forget this. Uh, does anybody here uh, know the Firefly role-playing game? Not the Serenity, I'm oh, sorry, the Serenity one, not the, the Firefly one. Serenity, one, two, three, okay. So they made two games for Firefly. One was called Serenity, it was based on the movie. And the funny thing about Serenity is actually not a bad game, but they had rules for guns that you could put on your ship, but no actual rules for fighting ship to ship. Like, you couldn't actually fight in space with the guns that you fought. I know. <laughs> so that's a, that's kind of a classic mistake, right? They were so excited about all the rest of it, they, they forgot about, well, should we fight in space? Is that part of Firefly or something? And it's right in the movie that you actually fight in space, so I probably would do that. <laughs> So this is kind of my basic foundation, right? Do I know what the game is about? Can I put that into my gameplay? Can I bring across the experience everything that's part of this? Because I want you to walk away from one of my games saying, that was the best river trading game 
I've ever seen. It, I may not be interested in river trading, but you know, hey, if I was, that's all I want. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's kind of where that that's the, the basic foundation of the philosophy. Now, obviously, you know, when you're designing a game, you're going to want to talk to the people and get feedback. Um, I am a very collaborative person. I like to not build things in a vacuum. I like to bring other people in and say, here's my idea, what do you think? And I learned a lot from those kind of interactions. Um, I'm not saying you need to take every bit of advice that comes your way because, frankly, you, you shouldn't. <laughs> but knowing what other people think about your game is important. It tells you some things that may not be working. It might get you to think second about some things you thought were perfect um, and it definitely gives you a, little, a slightly better idea about how people are going to react to it once it gets out into the wild. So, does anybody want to answer this question? Why shouldn't you accept every piece of feedback? This guy. Because each person has different levels of expertise and perceptions and some advice are more valuable because that person has more insight. That's part of it, absolutely. This guy. If, if you take all the information in and change it, then it's no longer, you might feel that it's no longer yours. That's a very good point. This gentleman back here. They're going to conflict all the time. I'm sorry. Everyone desires different things, so they're going to come into conflict. If you try to please everyone, yeah. you can't mesh all that in. There's a, there's, oh, oh okay, one more. Uh, it can mess up your original idea of the game, like you have this. Right package that has all the elements and if you add too much to it, it just... Right. We're talking about concept drift, is what you just brought up. So if you are not careful, your game can experience concept drift. Uh, this guy was also brought up by the gentleman back there is that uh, you can lose, you feel like you lose control over your game. You can feel like, wow, this game is no longer what I thought it was about anymore. You know, they didn't like they didn't like the mechanics about trading on the river. They thought that the river mechanics were, were broken. They didn't like the way the profit was done. And they really just want rules for fighting ship to ship. Well, that's not really a river trading game anymore. And I, I don't feel like I'm excited about river trading anymore. So that's a problem. So something I tell people that you know, want to be game designers, and this is a little controversial, but I, I learned it and I think it's still true. You have to have a little bit of arrogance. You have to say, this is the game I want to make because I want to make it that way. And that means you're right. <laughs> so sometimes people can come to you and they may have really good points and you should always listen, you should always hear them out. But at the end of the day, it's your game. And don't let it not be your game because if it's not your game, you're not going to want to work on it anymore. So have ownership. You have to have ownership of your game. That's that's a very important point. This gentleman here back here was talking about that. He says, you know, I, I wouldn't feel like it's mine anymore. It needs to be your game. And that means both the good and the bad. If the game comes out and there is a problem, and there is a flaw, there's something that didn't work, you own that. That's yours. No, you don't blame that on anybody else. That's you. Um, I have a game called Death Watch. It's a role-playing game about space brains. God, I love space marines. They're freaking awesome. But Deathwatch has a system that just doesn't work really well. It's called the uh, uh, Dark Heresy. No, it's called the Squad Mode. Uh. It's not part of part of Deathwatch. <laughs> Thank you, though. Uh, no, there's a part of Deathwatch called Squad Mode that doesn't really work. I wanted it to be a certain way, and you know, when the, when the book came out, it just it didn't quite get there. And I own that. I'm not. That is my game. Yes. I screwed it up, fine, I will do better next time. But that's because I have ownership in it. And people told me, you know, feedback, they said, well, how about this, how about that, that's great. But in the end, it was me who decided what goes into the game. So yeah, you want to be collaborative, you want to have some play testing going on, you want to learn lessons um, from things, and you're going to learn the biggest lessons from your mistakes as you start out as a game designer. That's important. So. There's another element to this that's going to be a little tough to hear. Um, a, a friend of mine, uh, Rick Priestley, he's a game designer at Games Workshop. He likes to call this killing your darlings.
So when you're a game designer and you have an idea for a mechanic or a piece of the world or something in the game and you're like, this is my favorite thing about this. This is the thing I want to do the most. That can actually blind you. That can actually be a thing that you don't necessarily need to focus on quite as much. And I know I just said you have to have ownership, but this is where that feedback can really come into play. You, you need to start thinking about sometimes, is this really important to the game? If someone had said to me, like, about squad mode, and said, is this really important to play Space Marines? I'd be like, not really, it's my favorite thing, and it was. I was so excited about it. I had this great idea, it was going to be the new uh, revolution in role-playing games. Well, maybe not quite that. I didn't think it was quite that good. But, you know, I was thinking it was innovative. I was trying to do something different, and, you know, I, was, I had a little bit of ego built into that, because I want something to be the Ross Watson different thing that was new and nobody had done it before, and it didn't work. I should have just taken it out. The game would have been better for it because I would have had uh, several pages worth of material that I could have used on other things, things that people really like and would have enjoyed more. So sometimes you have to kill your garlic. Sometimes you have to find that piece that is just your favorite, absolute, most emotional core of this game and eliminate it if you want the game to be good. I know that's tough to hear. <laughs> most people want to make games because they have this feeling it's going to be the most amazing thing to have other people play your games. And it is. When I'm here at Robocon and there's guys coming up to me and want me to sign their products, man, that is, that, is, that is amazing to me. It's like the pinnacle of my career is to have people say, I really like what you made. Um, so I kind of owe it to those people to give them the best product I can. And that means you have to sometimes let your ego get out of the way. And that's what this is about. It's difficult to see that without perspective. I, I realize I'm saying, you know, well, this is a thing I learned over 16 years. <laughs> and it's, it's a bunch of people who are like, okay, well, we don't have 16 years to learn all these lessons. Um, and that's why, the, that's why the, the feedback is important. Because sometimes you will talk to guys like myself or talk to people who have played lots of games and people have expertise. And I encourage you to do that when you, when you create your game. Seek out people who have knowledge to give you that kind of feedback. Um, let's say we're doing a river trading game. Uh, I would probably see if I, I have a friend of mine who does a riverboat in, uh, in Arkansas, actually. He's a brown water um, a pilot. Right? And I would ask him, hey, these, these rules we've got for creating rivers, how does it, is this okay? Is this cool? I would, I would find some expert opinion on that and find out what's going on. And uh, another part of that is you have to be really respectful, uh, especially these days. Um, if I'm making a game with elements from a culture that's not mine, let's say I'm making a game about samurai, okay? I would want to consult some ethnic Japanese people, at least consult them, because to, do, to do just make it based on my own biases, that's not really respectful. That's not really honoring you know, who the samurai were and what they're about. If I wanted to make a game about the Native Americans or the Aborigines in Australia, I am obviously neither one of those. <laughs> so I would want to seek out somebody and at least at least say, you know, what do you think? Is, there, is this is this a, a something that that is honored, you know, it honors your culture? Because you know, we we have a, a environment these days of, of game design where you want to do the game that is respectful to the other people's uh, perspectives and respectful to other cultures. To do otherwise is, you know, well, it's kind of being a jerk. I don't want to be a jerk. So, uh, so far, any questions? So far. Armin. Uh, one question came into mind about the experience, the essence. So, uh, yeah. how are they different? Like, what's, what? I didn't quite catch the uh, difference between experience and essence. Uh, okay, so, Legend of Five Rings is about honor. But you don't get the experience of having honor. The experience of Legend of Five Rings is you play a samurai. Right? All right. What it's about is different from the experience. Just like the experience of playing Halo is you move a reticle onto a target and pull a trigger. You could say that. You also could say it's the experience of being a superhuman soldier fighting wave upon wave of aliens. That's also true. Um, the essence of what Halo is about, I mean, I, I could probably break it down, but it's really a 
about, if I had to guess, um, Halo is about you know a really competitive, strong shooter type game. You know, if I if it would be uh, I don't know accuracy. <laughs> what do you, what do you think Halo would be about if you brought it down to its essence? Mm, it would be probably about a uh, frenetic action, a high octane shooting. Action. Yeah, high high octane shooting. Yeah, absolutely. That's very strongly related to the experience, and sometimes they are the same thing. Minecraft's essence is Minecraft's experience. It's about building things with blocks. It absolutely is. Not everything is going to be the same, but some of them are. Thank you. Anybody else questions about what we covered so far? Yes? Uh, it was all about TV killing the ideas. Killing your darlings, um, yeah. Well, it's not the first time I hear about it, but um, I'm just wondering, it might sound quite really difficult to see, know when the idea is something that you should kill. Uh, yeah, how, how do you know when you need to kill a darling? That's yeah. the question. That is a tough answer to give, too. I would say, you know, if, if, you're, if your darling is getting in the way of the experience somehow, if it's getting in the way of delivering what the game is supposed to deliver, because that's true of what happened to Deathwatch. The, uh, the, the squad mode stuff was intended to accomplish everyone feeling like they're part of a team, and it didn't do that. So I would say, I would say if your darling is not working, is it not going to actually deliver on that experience, that's when I would kill it. Again, it's a really broad topic, and there could be lots of other reasons why you need to kill your darling, but that's at least one I can give you. Yes? I'm like <clears throat> adding to this, I think it's not to say that everything you love about your game you should cut, because no. you love it. No. That's, don't, that's don't the point everything. of it. That's don't the point everything. of it. No. It's like getting way too passionate about one thing about your game, and then when that takes the limelight of the game itself, right. and the essence, and the gameplay, and yeah. it's like... I'm talking about triage. I'm talking about you have to do surgery, right? <laughs> it's like this game. This game is going to survive. It's going to. It's going to move on. But we have to remove this slightly small tumor that grew out of passion for a particular mechanic. Yes. And Ross, would you say that one good aid would be to start off with a couple of principles what the game is supposed to convey, and then sort of critically examine everything yes. as you go along? That's. I was just about to get to that. So what you're talking about is what's called a vision statement. Right? And then my mechanics, how do they how do they flow from one to the other? 
Um, it's a strong thing to have in your game, and, and as a consultant, I've worked with a lot of different companies. One of the first things I ask them is, do you have a Bible? Do you have a vision document for your work? And if they don't, I usually offer to do one for them for a fee, because it's a really smart thing to have. And, uh, yeah, exactly. That, that is, when you're talking about the pillars of your game and being able to compare, like, your, your perception to reality, that's the thing you're going to want to have. So, I'm sorry, is there one more question, or should we move on? Okay, so this is... Yeah, yeah um, about, you kind of implied about Savage Worlds, like, it's a universal system, but it's about something. It's about, yes. like, high, like, pulp adventure, or something like that, along those, along those lines. You use it to do something. Right. Well, we were talking about identity earlier, with the, the aspects of the gameplay and the, the experience. Savage World is a universal system, but it actually provides a unique experience. It provides a fast, fun, furious experience. It's, it's meant for uh, cinematic action. And that's a good point, because even, even as a, a very generic system which you can use anything in, it has a certain flavor that, that, that uh, trickles down. Okay? So if you were going to create a universal system, that's a really good point. You may want to consider uh, a, a, a particular twist on the experience that it only delivers. Uh, does anybody here play GURPS? Two, three, okay, so quite a few people. Uh, what, what, is, what does GURPS bring to the table that Savage Worlds wouldn't if you were going to run a game there? Probably Lots of work. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, is, what does GURPS bring that's, that's different? I think it's something that is easy to apply to any sort of story or gameplay scenario. It's, 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 uh, it's value is it's even more Universal yeah. inside of Worlds, because GURPS can do literally anything. But it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And, you know, that's that's a judgment call. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I find games that can do anything a little less interesting than games that do a, a, a one thing specifically. But uh, the thing that that's important to, to mention, though, is sometimes it, uh, what you see as a weakness can also be a strength. Because GURPS, if you can't find anything else that will model something appropriately, GURPS is. Not a bad way to go. Just saying. Um, there was a question over here somewhere. And I guess it was you. Okay. I was just saying, like, in my opinion, GURF brings challenge to the table. There's, like, there's always, in my opinion, difficult to actually achieve something in that game. It's very easy to put on challenge in that game. That, that may be a possibility. Uh, challenge is actually part of experience. Um, and it, what's interesting here is. Uh, there's games that have challenge that is pretty much, that's their whole point. Um, does anybody here play XCOM? Lots of people play XCOM. Do you play it on Iron Man? Lots of people play it on Iron Man. Iron Man is a very specific challenge for XCOM. You can only save, or you can't save at all, right? Uh, nope. Only the base. Automated, I see, automatic saving. It had only auto saves were allowed, yeah. right? And uh, Dark Souls and Demon Souls. I mean, who knew that we wanted games that made us so freaking frustrated? We didn't know. Nobody knew until that product came out. If someone had a questionnaire, and this is like going back to the whole, like, why you should you not listen to feedback. If I asked someone 20 years ago, hey, if I make a game that's horribly challenging and you will, you will just, like, die and die and die before you get anywhere, would you want to play that? They would probably say no. <laughs> but then the game came out and they were like, yes, please, more of that. <laughs> so it, it, it is definitely interesting to see sometimes what we don't know that we want until we actually get it. So, anyway. Uh, so let's say you have done all the stuff we've talked about, you've developed some mechanics or you've based it on an existing mechanic and you're putting a spin on it. Um, the next step would be prototyping. So I have got this idea, I've made my vision document about the river traders. We have uh, talked to some people about the uh, the, the rules, and we've shown people the, uh, the pillars of the game. But now it's time to get a game playable that we can actually take around and try. That's what a prototype is. It's something that you can play with, that actually you can uh, you can complete a game using it. Now this is far more uh, appropriate to things like card games and board games than to tabletop roleplay, because by the time you get to this stage in tabletop roleplay, you're pretty much ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, uh, card games and board games specifically, this is a very important step. And if you are trying to sell your product to a different company, let's say you're not self-publishing it, let's say you're taking it to another company, let's say you're going to 
uh, AEG or Days of Wonder or something like that, and you want to sell your game, you have to show them a prototype. You have to show, hey, this this game of, of River Traders, you have a little boat that goes here, and this is the cards I put down to see what the uh, black market's doing, and you know, that kind of thing. Yes, question. Uh, when it comes to role-playing games, so at what stage actually do you get to prototype the, uh, for example, leveling mechanics comparing, comparing Dark Hersey to Black Crusade? The first is a bit clunky, the, the next is a bit more flexible and smooth. Okay, well that's, that's slightly different than prototype. Um, that's actually iteration, and I'll talk about that. Um, but you're, you're saying at what stage does a prototype for a tabletop game Basically, so that out. it has a good flow in it, so that you you don't get stuck in minute detail and time saving, you know. Okay, well, prototype is, is supposed to be the initial, like the basic game. It, it doesn't need to be the, the polished game. Prototype gets to the polished game through a step called iteration. Okay, so a prototype of Black Crusade might actually look just like Dark Heresy. It might be really clunky, and we're testing it, we're playing, and you're saying to me, this is not right. Okay. There's a so so the difference between a review step and a prototype is we're actually playing the game as opposed to like I just hand you like my idea. Here's my idea for Black Crusade. And you're like okay, that's kind of cool. And then we play it and you're like oh wait, this is way better than Dark Heresy because I can move my my career around or whatever. Okay. So that's actually a good point. Can you read my handwriting? Because I such this. Sure. Yeah. Polished product is what that says. And the step in between is iteration. <coughs> so iteration is where you take your prototype, you test it, you find some things you need to change, you go through uh, different versions of the actual product until you get something that you feel like this is done. Does anybody... Uh, is anybody here planning to do things is completely on their own? Like no team, just you making a game? Several people, okay, that's, that's interesting. When, it, when you're on your own, you get to be the decider. You get to choose when things happen, and it is instantaneous, and it's actually kind of awesome. How many people are willing are gonna work with a team to get a product done? Okay, many more. So when you work with a team, it's a little more uh, interesting. Uh, iteration can be a much more different process with a team as opposed to a single person. Uh, because there's many voices that have to be listened to, there's many different opinions that come up. Um, and it's really important during this step, if you have a team, there needs to be someone who's the decider. You have to have a single voice that can say, okay, I've heard everything, but this is what we're going with. There are a lot of games I've seen people try to make in a team that basically dies in committee. Uh, because people will argue and they'll take sides and it'll become this, this thing of you know, half people want X, half people want Y, and nothing ever gets done. Right? And that's going to lead me to another part here. Iteration is, is cool and it's important because you want to get a finished product and you want that product to be good. You want it to be a good game. And that's going to take me to my next step. You actually don't want is you don't want a perfect game. Something I've learned is to don't let perfect get in the way of good. So I talked about my mistakes. I talked about Dark uh, Death Watch. I talked about how, you know, if I could do it again, I would have taken that part out. Okay. If I had taken more time, maybe six months, maybe a year, maybe two years, I probably could have made that game absolutely flawless. But the thing is, that would be two or three years, or six months, or however much time that I wasn't making something else. And Death Watch, I will stand by this product, Death Watch is a good game. I would rather make ten good games than one perfect game. And the fact of the matter is, uh, perfection is a great ideal. Absolutely, like, I want my game to be perfect. I would never start a project saying, I don't want my game to be perfect, except that I know that it won't be. <laughs> and 
And that's perspective. That's 16 years coming to the fore, right? Even, even if I spent all 16 years on one game, it probably wouldn't be perfect. Um, but it might get really close. Who knows? Anyway, it's a great idea to chase. But what can happen is you can end up not doing anything because you're too busy trying to iterate, too busy trying to work out all the kinks in the product. And that's, again, when you have a team and you have a decider, it's really important for someone to be able to say, okay, we've come far enough. The game delivers on the experience. It has the essence. It has the mechanics that we want. It's good enough. <laughs> it's good enough and get it out. Um, in the panel we were at just, just here, uh, in the last panel, there was a, a gentleman talking about a game they were making about models and how they spent all this time making these beautiful 3D models uh, for the characters to, to wear the dresses and be on the catwalks and things like that. And they were just going to make the most perfect, he even used that term, the most perfect game about modeling ever. And they got, they, they, they spent, I think, two years or something like that building this game, and then the Kim Kardashian game came out. And the market was gone. They couldn't afford to make that game anymore. And I was thinking to myself, yeah, that's an awful lot of wasted effort. I mean, I would love to have seen the game that they made, but the fact of the matter is they couldn't make the game because they were chasing perfection. And I know guys that have been working on a game and they've had it in their desk for decades, and it's just they think it's not ready yet. It's not ready yet. Dude, just make the game. <laughs> just get it out there. Um, has anybody heard the phrase that you have to be bad at something before you're good at something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, make, make the terrible version of your game. It's okay. Make, make a bad game if you really want to, but at least make something. Because if you make nothing, you're just going to be chasing that perfection. Um, we all want our products to be good, and good is the goal I aim for, and good is what I am really proud to say I'm happy with all of the things I've made. They're good. Some of them are even great. Like, Road Trader's pretty great. Um, but good is, what I, good is where I say, let's make it, let's get it out to the market. We can always make a second edition, we can always release a RADA. If it's a uh, computer game, we can patch it. Or we can do a DLC. Um, but we can make a really good game. And that's what I think, as a game designer, that's what I want my legacy to be. I made a lot of good games, and a few great ones. Um, but if I made just one perfect game and then died, I don't know. I mean, I guess uh, there's probably a few people that are like that, but um, that's what I want. So, uh, all right. And any questions for everyone? Yes, sir. What's the prototype? Yeah, um, I kind of like. Maybe the comment of the medium. So in your opinion, what is the minimum viable prototype that you could start with? The minimum viable prototype is something that delivers the experience. At least a basic version of the experience. Okay, River Traders was the, the, the example. If I have a prototype that it just at least has a boat, a river, some goods to trade, and a bad guy, okay, I, I can prototype with that. Um, one of the things you might learn in, in iteration is we need more content. <laughs> it's, it's giving me kind of a river trader, but to be actually a river trader, I'm going to need more. Right? Uh, but, but I think that's the, that's the basic step. I mean, if, 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 as I said, this is going to have to be partly on you. You would have to decide for yourself. I feel like this is ready. Uh, but, but my advice would be to do it early, to do it when you have a very basic idea. Because the guys at Pixar, have a book out called Creativity Inc. And this is, this is a creative never. Building games is a very creative thing. It's like art, okay? There is no one true way to do it. And the guys at Pixar say, fail early and fail often because that's the best way to learn. So I would get my prototype out early. I would say, that, you know, here's my basic, what do you think? Oh, I failed here? Okay, I'll fix that. Car, uh, tops. Close enough. I said tops. I said clouds. I got out there. You got it. I caught this. <laughs> <laughs> We've had fun with them. I know. Sorry. Have you ever done anything else with no iteration, with just the prototype is the end product? I don't think so, but I my mind works a little differently than most people. Like I'm usually iterating even as I'm making the prototype. <laughs> yeah, sure, but I'm even, even as I'm like putting it together, like I know what I need to add here. Um, but something where the thing that went out the door was, was the first the time anyone else. Tested it or saw it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, like I said, I really I don't think you know my mind just really doesn't work that way. Most of the time, I 
I'm collaborating with someone and at the least, like I said, what do you think before it goes out the door? I just don't do, I, I, would, I would feel bad if I put something out without at least testing it, sure. or talking to someone about it. If I just was like, oh, here you go. It's good. Yeah. Um, I would feel bad. So I haven't done that. Sir? Yes. Uh, about the prototype or like continuation for that, uh, what do you suggest is the like, good timeline? For making the like game, like how how much do you <laughs> use it? Your a timeline for making a game. Um, or like, is it's better to use like only one year, or is it better to like use ten years from? <laughs> well, I think t I think ten years is probably too long for any game. <laughs> Certainly. Um, what I mean, it depends on the scope, right? What is the scope of your game? That's a good point. So if my game is just going to be, uh, let's say. A card game, and it's going to be 50 cards, right? If I'm, I buy a card game and I have 50 cards, I could probably test that and get it out the door. I would be, I would feel bad if I didn't get it done in say more than a year. That's a long time. I would, I would think I would be, I would be taking it slow. Um, but again, this is kind of the, you know, your own path. You might be a slightly slower guy, you might be a slightly faster guy. Um, it's going to depend on what you want to produce. Uh, I have a acquaintance of mine named uh, Steve Long, and he is a ex-lawyer who now writes role-playing games. And he writes something like 10,000 words a day. He's a machine. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's the face I make right there. Uh, he is a machine, and if, for him, a 400 page book is nothing. It's like, oh yeah, I'll get that done uh, next month, right? Uh, for me, 400 page book, that's, that's a year worth of work at least, uh, maybe more. So, some of that's going to depend on you, but it, it, the scope of the project is going to determine some of that. This should be part of your uh, vision statement. It should, you, should, you should have an idea of like how long, how long do I want to go before this game is done? And I really recommend you do that so that you don't just sit there and keep iterating. <laughs> if you at least have some kind of timeline in mind, it's a good idea. Uh, if you at least have some kind of timeline in mind, you can say to yourself, well, maybe I'm a little late, maybe I'm a little early. Um, so it is, it is part, it's also going to be part of your, um, your iteration, too. You're going to say, well, we've been working on this for six months. Maybe it's time to move on to something else. Or we've been working on this only for a week. Let's try it for another week. And you know, let's sleep on it and see if we think differently in the morning. Uh, so absolutely, it's a good point to think about that. But I can't tell you like without knowing what kind of game. Yeah, I, I didn't mean that. Like you like have to tell me how long it takes to make that game. I was like thinking about how, uh, how long you like should like use for like game. Does it depends how big it is. Yeah, it depends on, depends on the scope. Um, let's say, uh, have you guys played um, Pathfinder? Right? Pathfinder is a big book. It's a big, big, solid book. They put basically the Monster Manual, the Player's Guide, and the DM's Guide all in one place. And that's a big difference from something like uh, Fate Accelerated. Does anybody know Fate Accelerated? It's like 40 pages long. <laughs> it's a very, very quick game. Uh, Klaus, your uh, Wizards Academy. How many people were in that? Uh, 140 per game. Right. So that's the scope of that game. How many? How long would it take you to build a similar size bar from scratch? This is something where I'm going to lie and say it takes more time than it does. So I don't think it's serious. I do. Um, <laughs> you tell me. For the right thing, the right people, the right resources. Two weeks. So, there you go. But I'd rather have half of you. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But you want it, if you want it to be good, half a year. Okay. But you could prototype in two weeks. No, no, we don't prototype. Yep. Why should not prototype? Okay. You could reiterate if you do the same one more than one time. But what, that was okay. why I asked, because we, it would be nice to hear experiences from that. Right, so so ours, the first product is yeah. the first prototype, and that's interesting. Well, that, that, that's an interesting point, because your media is a little more performance and less physical product. So there's a lot going on there. But you probably have review steps when you're working on the concept and you're working on the scope and things of that nature. So two weeks is a good idea to like we have an idea of what we're gonna make. You know, or we're gonna have an idea of how the game's gonna run. Right? 
And to be honest, when we do this, like when some outside customer comes and says, can you do a lot of these? these are like the ideas, we discuss scope, loose chat, da, da, da. Um, if it's somebody that's important enough and we can set off the time that we can go from the loose chat to the, the finished sketch right. that they can say yes or no to in a day. Okay, so that's good. Like I said, there's different, scope, scope is, is different for all kinds of games and there's no one true way. Um, Klaus is extremely quick, you should hire him. <laughs> the man can get it done. All right, well this is gonna bring me close to the end of the first half, and we will start building a game in the second half, but before we jump to that, does anybody have any further questions? Okay, great, let's make a game. <laughs> so, uh... Ross, can we do a toilet break? No. Good, so I did one already. Yes. Uh, have you used computers as uh, balancing aid for games? For mechanics? Yeah. Okay, yes. Well, that's, that's going to depend on the type of designer you are. Some people are really interested in getting a perfect balance of mechanics. And it's far more important in games like card games and miniature games than it is in other uh, types. So the software games, too, you need to have that mathematical equational balance. Uh, I would probably turn to someone who's better at, better at it than me, but if I was building a, a, a card game, let's say I want to make the next Magic the Gathering, right? Balance super important. Uh, I would find someone who's really, really good at that. I, I personally am not. Uh, but I would find someone who's really good at that and have them run the numbers to, to get that kind of a balance factor. Um, for role-playing games, it depends on the level of mechanics you have. Some games are very rules light, some games are very rules heavy. And game balance is actually a thing we could talk about for an entire session. <laughs> we could have a whole other panel on game balance. Uh, but it is very, very important for strictly mechanical games like card games and board games. So yes, the answer is yes, I can use a computer, but it would probably be someone else using a computer. So have, have you done something? Have I done it? I, I, or have you done I have subcontracted it. <laughs> so I found someone who was really good at that thing and had to do it, because I personally am not. Um, I am what's called an intuitive designer. I, I, I'm like, that looks like it would work. It feels like it would work. Let's try it. Um, whereas my friend James Hada, who works on uh, Magic the Gathering, uh, James is like, no, no, no. We have to put it into the Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to play just it 500 times. Uh, that would be James. Uh, so that's why I, if I was doing a card game, I would ask James to run the computer on that. But yes, um, it's a good point to ask about that. Anyone else? Yes? Yeah, uh, regarding playtesting and that period of time, how do you usually organize it? How do you uh, work with other people who play test? What kind of feedback do you look for? Uh, I think it's kind of like an interesting period okay. of the game design. That could also probably be a whole uh, panel on its own, but um, very briefly, I would reach out to people who know, know the type of game that I'm looking for and new people. I would want a mix of both. Uh, I would want people, if I was playtesting a LARP, which I don't, I don't know if you even can, uh, but if I was, I would get people like Klaus who know the LARPs really, really well, and I would get people like, uh, I would get people like my roommate's daughter who's never LARPed before, and I would put them in the game and I would ask them the same set of questions to kind of get an idea from both an old, an old timer and a new timer what it was like. Um, I would be looking for feedback about my game's experience. Did it give you the experience I wanted to give you? Did you feel like a river trader when you were on the river with your little boat and making profit on whatever you were carrying in the boat? Because we forgot that part. <laughs> did you uh, did you understand that the game was about river trading? You know, did, did I communicate the experience, the uh, the essence to you? Were the mechanics clunky? Did you feel like making a river was really hard? Because all this real world shit about making a river from Ross's friend who does a pilot boat. Um, that kind of stuff. That's what I would want to know. Um, very, very shortly. I mean, obviously, again, we can talk about it at length. Uh, okay, I'm ready to make a game. Are you guys ready to make a game? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so first of all, let's talk about experience. What kind of experience do we want to give people? This guy. The Cold War Space Race. Cold War Space Race. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that's. Close. All right. Give them the experience of being in it. That, that a sense of urgency, oh. needing to be, to be there first, because there's, your yes. prestige is on the line. Okay. Now we, we've actually already got our essence too. Sense <laughs> of urgency. I like that. Cold War 
space race. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, we have a sense of urgency. That's what the game is about. The Cold War Space Race is the experience I want to give you of being in it and being competitive, obviously, with someone else. Um, so, uh, probably talking about the USA and the USSR, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we've got that. We've got the sense of urgency. Uh, we have a little bit of our core activity already. Who are we? We Are we scientists? Are we engineers? The political administration, probably. We are the governments. <laughs> we're, we're the administration? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're the administration. So we're the administration and we're trying to do what? Build a spaceship. Build a spaceship. That's good. That's the now. Despite what? The opposition. <laughs> Scientists. Oh, the In competition. The competition. Yeah. Espionage. The other part of the administration. Yes, espionage is great because we can have spies. You guys say, oh, well, hang on, this is your game. Not mine. I'm getting excited now. What do, what do you, okay, let's quick consensus. Do we want espionage or do we want scientists? Do we want the other competition? What do we want? Mm -hmm. Espionage. Uh, espionage. Okay, I keep it. <laughs> All right, despite espionage. Okay, so we have our sense of urgency is what it's about. This is who we are. This is the experience we're delivering. That's great. Um, what kind of game is it going to be? Is it board game, card game, LARP? Could it be LARP? Could it be easily Yeah. Uh, secret information board game? Secret information board game? Yeah, board game sounds fun. Board game. Is that the consensus board game? Mm -hmm. Okay, I see a lot of nodding heads. Okay. So it is a secret information board game. <laughs> so that is our gameplay. All right, cool. <laughs> so uh, how many players? Let's talk about scope. Mm. Two person asymmetrical. Two person asymmetrical. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Something like, like four players? Multiplayer asymmetrical, like one is the government, the other, the other players are spies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, like or teams. you could yeah, do like, like all the players, which are like probably like four, who have the major countries and also play the country espionage. Mm -hmm. So it's not like uh, the big evil versus all the good spies. It's actually all of them being bad and good at the same time, trying to get to the same. Okay, so we have same. a, and the, make sure I understand this correctly, we have a government player and, and spy players? Well, we have, no, that's... Okay, well, um, you were saying that we have, I mean, I everybody's in government and spies. Yeah, practically, yes. Okay. So you all have your own resources depending on what country you are, for instance. And then you're both trying to build the ship as the government and then spy out what others are doing. Okay, but that, that is, to, to make that asymmetrical, we would have to, uh, we would have to change that up slightly, right? There'd have to be, you know, yeah. purge to specific governments. Yeah, so you could make, like, yeah, giant it's arm. still not technically asymmetrical, but, okay. Um, I'm, I'm not a, exactly on the board of, like, I don't, I don't understand the asymmetrical term. Asymmetrical, okay. This may not be playing enough board games, but yeah, I know. No, it's, it's, it's cool. I mean, um, so asymmetrical is where uh, the type of gameplay is slightly different for the, the, the individual players. Um, there's a video game called Evolve, where one player is a giant monster and the other is a Yeah, so Imperial Assault, the board game, yes. would be like multiplayer asymmetrical. Uh, I think so. I haven't played it. Okay. It's like the Descent, so there's the Overlord. Yeah, the Descent, the descent is asymmetrical. also asymmetrical. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah well, that's basically Plus, Simple solution to make it four players so that each country has both a builder who builds the rockets and a spy master who does the spy stuff, so you have the asymmetrical thing. And then you also have that they're fighting internally for resources each turn on do we want to build most or spy most? Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I was thinking uh, exactly the same thing. Yes. And every country could have like their speciality to a like Sure, USA. KGB or USSR can be very good at espionage, but the USA is a good bit building. Yes, 
We can also take it completely out of the box and we will have only one spy as a mercenary who people are fishing. <laughs> 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 okay, you like you like that idea? Okay, so there's only one spy. One spy. Okay, only one spy. Um, four players. So one player is a spy, and the other three players are governments, hmm. or they have, or, or you want to use classes idea to help. One is a builder or or a scientist. Okay. Governments. So. And everyone wins individually. So Why spy can win. Two countries, one spy, and one scientist. <laughs> two countries, one spy, one scientist. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it's called war, it could be a German scientist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, alright, that's fair. So, two governments, one spy, and one scientist. Those are the players. <laughs> okay, and you know, it's, it, I, I may be wrong, but it may be historically accurate that there was a scientist who worked with both programs. Werner von Braun, right? Von right. Braun? Yeah. Okay, cool. And individual countries have bonuses, four players, and it's multiplayer asymmetrical. Yeah. Okay, uh, it, I, obviously this is a competitive game, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. How do you determine victory? First, you want to build a spaceship. First, you want to find a spy on your own spaceship. Each individual. character would have to have their own goals. Mm -hmm. Like the spy uh, wing is if. Yeah, so some is managed, yeah, some stretch goal is managed. And then the countries win if they've reached the yeah. That's the secret information. Everyone has their own secret objective they are trying to complete. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe the spaceship isn't what the government is wanting to make in the end. Maybe that's a ploy. Okay. okay. They want a build. Then it's actually a nuclear bomb. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it's not that they make their people, the citizens, believe that they have visited the yeah, okay. true. Probably you don't have to build a spaceship if you fake it. Yeah, we'll put it in the Yeah, maybe the spy uh, wins if there's a several number of turns and none of the countries reach the moon because he profits of this Cold War. So the countries who want to get their yeah. well, yeah. uh, like as soon as possible, the, the, the spy the wants to profit. And the scientist is like opposite that he's trying to serve as much information for both. He wins if somebody makes it. Yeah. yeah, so it, okay. uh, he tries to like, make most, most of the money for the And you introduce urgency with that also. It also yes. doesn't have to be, it doesn't also have to be um, um, binary, victory defeat. It can also be uh, victory points. Mm -hmm. You get so many points for going to the moon. The spy gets so many points for nobody going to the moon. And then at the end, we all tally up and see who's got the most points. Mm -hmm. And there could be points in the secret orders and things like that too. Uh, which would make it a little more interesting because then it's not like, oh, well, we went to the moon now, the game's over. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, the spy payments and such. Um, this could be again the hidden information with the victory chips. You draw the chips. They are different value, but you don't know until the end of the game. This keeps a kind of guessing going on because people can't be like, oh, he has 40 points. Okay, so I can gain this. Well, here's a problem, and I see a problem right away. I love the idea, by the way. You guys are very creative, but I think I think one of our big problems is. I forgot what our game is about. <laughs> we said our game is about a sense of urgency, but now we have all these complex stuff about, like, let's slow it down, let's fake it, let's, you know, the spy wins and nobody gets to the moon. Is there a sense of urgency there? Well, that's okay, because if we like the gameplay more, we can change this. I mean, this is not set in stone, right? But if this is what you want, you have to think about that in terms of how the game's going to work. So, show of hands, how many people think we need to change the essence? One. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so our essence remains the same. What was the, uh, the other slide? How many people want to change mechanics? Okay. Quite a few. Okay. If people are neutral and they won't vote either way sometimes. No, but like, for instance, to create a sense of urgency for the spy instead of just yeah, the spy wins if no one goes to the moon, would be like, his life is on the line? Like, we governments could. should like say that, well, we're gonna turn you in right. if you don't give us enough information. So the spy has to constantly come up with new ways to bring it out. So let's talk about that. That's a really good idea. So we're, uh, what I mentioned earlier is talking about using the essence and bringing that into mechanics, right? That's a good place to start. What are mechanics that build a sense of urgency 
in general. Time limit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a time limit where we have, uh, what are some other ways to build urgency? Opposed on players? I'm sorry? Budget. Like, uh, the money. A budget. budget. So limited resources. Limited resources, okay. Yeah, that might work. So, uh, like sudden dead victory. If you don't mm -hmm. take a risk, then the other one might be. So my, my great idea is that spy wins if, if a nation launches a rocket with, which fails. <laughs> And so, yeah. so you know in civilization when you are building a wonder, yes. and then you see that another civilization is building the same wonder. Yes. Then you get this nervous feeling that they might might complete it, it, it one turn before you do it. So I think there probably ought to be some kind of competition mechanic where, regardless, like let's say we have two government players and they're both trying to build a rocket, uh, there probably should be some kind of card or event that catches up whoever's behind. And makes it an even race. Because that would make it a sense of urgency. That would be like, oh, now we're neck and neck. Like milestones, though. Like first one to orbit, first person to orbit. Milestones. First one to moons to orbit. Milestones, yeah, that's a good idea. First one to send a monkey up. <laughs> and that's historically accurate, too, because in the USA got the huge boost when they realized the Soviets have Sputnik in orbit, sending signals. Exactly. That's, that's, a, that's a good point. So that's, that's, a, that's a great. So now we have a lot of things that are helping us build that essence, right? Don't you feel a little bit better about the game now? Yeah. <laughs> it's cool that excitement builds me a lot of plus. I realize that I can't shake off my head of doing this sort of stuff normally, so instead of thinking of all the cool mechanics and all the cool ideas, I'm thinking of how to make it easier to produce. So I want to make this a human game, because then I can cut research and just do fun stuff, and everybody's going to have fun because they look at fun illustrations and it's about laughing together. And you have a larger target audience and trying to do something like this is and correct and keeping within our weird game mechanics is uh, going to be pretty pretty hard. Yeah, so my like feelings the... are, how do we make this as easy to, how do we minimize our workload? Yeah. Not the game, we'll make that great. <laughs> but one, one way to do that is to set a tone. And you can set a tone of urgency. Um, what if we, for example, what if we did something like Mad Max and 5 versus 5? It's got a great, it's got a great some verses to it. It's got that lighthearted tone with a lot of jokes, and we don't have to be as hard accurate, but we can if we want. Um, what do you guys think about that? You want a, you want a lighthearted space race game, or a more serious? Does anyone play the the board game Nuclear War? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can I get a consensus? Light, heavy, heavy, light, light, heavy, 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 heavy. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Show us how the lower will do. <laughs> okay, uh, show the answer for heavy instead of light. Okay, you're out, way out of the class. Sorry. <laughs> okay, it's, it's a heavy series. <laughs> this is serious business. We must get to the moon. Okay. Uh, so these are all things that can help us with our sense of urgency. So let's keep those in mind. And what do we want to keep from here? Do we want to keep the multiplayer asymmetrical? Do we want to keep the secret info? Do we want to keep country bonuses? Give the scientist an add contract. Huh? Give the scientist an add third contract. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not in China. <laughs> Not in China. Not in China. Not in China. Not in China. What would you do if you're building upside down? But instead of countries wanting to go to the moon, there are instead something like uh, arts and recreations. Uh, what's the guy there? Ron? Something. Swanson. Swanson. Uh, yeah. They're liberal and think that there should be no expenses, so it's like they want to sabotage it. They lose if they go to the moon. They're being counters. <laughs> uh, is, is that something that would be, uh, you want to add to this? I don't know. Okay. Just about the origins. Yes. I guess the idea is that the three players are kind of competing at, at each other, and the spy is kind of a game master-ish guy, or a uh, kind of like a dealer. Okay. That's that, like the house wins if nobody wins. Now, the, we, this kind of goes back to the idea of something like Descent, where you have an overlord mm. and the players are you know, working cooperatively against him. But in this case, it's still, it's still competitive. Um, yes? That could actually work really well. We could change the spy to actually represent, manage the resource of the globe because there's brain drain, there's public descent. Basically, he could mix up the board. Is he like the banker in Monopoly? Uh, no, no could, could actively participate by changing the conditions on the board and force the players to adapt. How does he win? 
uh, denying either of the three players from reaching. Okay, but does that, is, is there still such urgency for him now? Well, yeah, because they are going to reach the moon eventually. Okay. If well, you well, if, we, if we can come up with a way to make him scramble and be like, oh, I have to be urgent, you know, I think that would work. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. Yes, in the back. Uh, also, we don't want to force him into feeling like he's the kingmaker. Like, um, right. he decides who wins in the end. Right. So you guys are already iterating. This is how I work. <laughs> right? I have an idea and I'm like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so, yeah, you're already iterating. You're already saying, well, we have to, you know, not have this problem. We have to work around this issue. Uh, okay. So we will, we'll, we'll go with that idea that the spy is the resource manager. I can't think of a better term. So he's a resource manager, and we got three governments, and they're all racing to get their rocket up. Um, do we still have secret info? Secret little envelopes? Yeah. Mm, it it goes check this just now. Okay. It keeps the it keeps the urgency because someone got ha ha my secret objective has been completed. <laughs> All right, so how do we put in our time limit? We can just say in the rules that the game has a limited number of turns. It yeah. could just be mm -hmm. six turns, ten turns, whatever it is. Yeah. I like the ten turns because it's like the countdown. You can put on, <laughs> yeah. you, you actually have a board. Part of your board could be kind of designed as a countdown from ten to one. I think of some wonders here. You could have a, 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 a separate decks of cards, and when the deck has been spent. Then, sort of, you move on to the next phase. You could have a countdown deck. Yes. Okay. So we have a uh, countdown deck. You could also have a real time countdown, so the game only lasts half an hour. <laughs> well, that could, be, that could be a problem if uh, you order pizza or the dog needs to go for a walk and the baby's crying. So uh, that's the only thing I brought up about that. Um, although, is anybody played Twilight Imperium? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like that Twilight Imperium. <laughs> <laughs> After five hours, we're done. <laughs> we're just done. <laughs> Alright, so we want to have limited resources. So that's where the, this guy's suggestion of the resource manager comes in. Uh, his, his role will have to deal with that, right? With keeping, keeping it uh, a, a scramble for the resources, somehow. Uh, and we have our competition because the guy who gets to move first wins, right? And our milestones, those might be also part of the countdown deck. You know, you have to get. Uh, to orbit by turn five. You have to get to, you know, I don't know, we could probably come up with ways to do that with the, uh, the captain deck. You know, like that. Sort of a problem that I see there is that at least the countries, they're kind of, kind of being active, right? Yeah, they're active. The spy is being reactive in the sense that um, he, I, I don't see him trying to reach a goal, rather he's preventing others from doing things, right? So it is not actively moving towards something, but he's reacting to what other people do, trying to meet those. And hence, I don't think he's kind of waiting always for other people to do something. Yeah. And hence, I don't see the urgency on, on his side. How many people think this doesn't work? Quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it was a good idea. Maybe we can still keep it. And that might have been your darling. Uh, no, no, not really. <laughs> we just killed it. Uh, resource manager then be the deck of cards that, like, for example, right. every turn for the countdown, you take X number of cards, which, which then sort of show that there's descent in certain countries and things in there, and then yeah, you have people, to work yeah. with different resources. Yeah, like people revolting, so you have to put money there to make them happy. Did you say people are revolting? <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> So it, is, it was actually the space where it's a resource uh, battle or some sort of research information. <laughs> well, it was information. Well, yeah, but like information. How do it fit both? If it fit both, then how do it fit both? Yeah, it was probably most an engineering battle. Hmm. So what you guys are experiencing right now is this is a team effort. Yeah. <laughs> You're all working together. But you know, I have been up here making the decisions. I've been the decider. I think that probably needs to change because it's not my game. It's your game. So who amongst you wants to be the one who says, it's time to move on? Got me one voice. <clears throat> that guy. <laughs> Everybody say Sorry, no? guys. That is, is it cool? All right, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so at least we, we, can, we can debate, and he has really good points. And everybody should listen. You have good points. Um, but the, the, the panel closes in uh, half an hour, so I'm just glad to come down. <laughs> <laughs>
So, all right, cool. Um, I, I think we're missing some things. We're missing a role for our fourth player, uh, which we need to come up with something. And you guys are having a great debate about, you know, what to do with the resources. So, what's the next? What should we do? Yeah. It was a suggestion on how to put our sense of urgency into our design process. Yes. So we have like 30 minutes left. Yeah. Yeah, um, 20 minutes or so, I go out and find us uh, a couple of investors who we then make a presentation for the last time. Shark Tank! <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes, okay, sounds good. Uh -huh. If you will take on the role of the I'll, investors. I'll find the investors. You'll find the investors. Okay, so we have 20 minutes to get to a point where we can pitch this game. <laughs> 20 minutes. Yes, okay. uh, I'm on board with that. So we, have, we need a fourth player, right? Right. Is Where the fourth player you? like our darling? Let's kill it. Is four players a darling? <laughs> we need uh, one country more. Yeah, yeah. We, need that, that, we may need to kill the asymmetrical part of it. But does the spy have to play the same game? Do we need the asymmetrical part? Can the spy be a card? Emergency. Can the spy? Yes, yeah, I can totally be a card. There's no reason why I can be a card. I actually like this guy's suggestion that we kill asymmetrical. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing is, um, I love the idea. I thought it was great. Oh, let's do asymmetrical. And then. <laughs> All right, just hide her? Uh, Don instead. <laughs> yeah. All right, so it is a four-player game. We are all governments. We are all trying to reach space with secret orders. There is a spy card. I should probably write some of this down. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> is this spy card or spy dead? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. 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 Spy the game. Spy the game. Ownership. Or it could be something you like. Something you say somewhere and then there is the How about a spy hey. token that rotates and every turn, whoever gets that gets to steal technology from someone else? Nice. But the point is you have like different decks that like you have to think about what happened there. There was a lot of political pressure, so there was political willingness to do that. Now we have a scientist token. <laughs> well, I'm just going to right? So I'm just going to remind you right? I'm just going to remind you of something. Our original context was despite espionage. Right? Our original context was we are uh, governments trying to get to the moon despite espionage. So that was, a, that was part of our vision, was espionage as a big factor. Now, I, again, I think you have great ideas. The scientist token and, the, and, and doing more with engineers, those are all great. But does it fit our vision document? Do we need to change the vision document? Or do we need to change our thinking and go back to that? Uh, yes? Uh, I was thinking about adding uh, like new elements to it, like propaganda. Like propaganda? It, yeah. Okay. <laughs> because it would uh, work well with the whole the espionage and spying and kind of trying to Oil. Through propaganda, trying to steal like resources. And, and you can like, slowly somebody and you add it like, more to your. If you look at this really in the dualistic way, the propaganda could go into boosting some sort of domestic production in technology, while the spy cards, the spy token or cards would be aggressive, like what you can use to affect the other player's progression or even hamper it. Okay, lots of great ideas. Well, what if we 15 minutes left? <laughs> what if we need a spy like Hitler to catch on Kiev? Oh no, I don't always say. Yeah, he's the guy. Yeah, 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 but with your mechanic that uh, you can, uh, there is a certain way of controlling him, uh, force of like uh, you have to spend your resources uh, intentionally to move it, or with your chance to move it. Yeah, yeah, like, like the band in Bhutan, you have cards and yeah. you yeah. of the place. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. We have 15 minutes left, and the thing is, we need a basic prototype, right? We can always build that up later. And, and we have uh, research facilities, uh, production facilities on the uh, pilot order uh, areas. Okay. And, and the resource pools are made up uh, of an fixed amount, not a random amount from those. So you have direct way of manipulating the way of the game, except actual uh, draw from the decks, which are shared with both players and have limited number on each. This is the guy I would get to balance my board game. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the game ends at, uh, when one of the decks runs up. When one of the decks runs down, or all one one of the slides, or any well, of the slides from it is. We decided earlier though yeah. that the deck. Yeah, well, that was just the lightning part. Right. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying. Yeah. Uh, yes. Kill all the stuff that is advanced and undefined. 
put in the physical building mechanic and building space just because that's fun and have that ready and sitting all the time. Yeah, investors yeah. come in. <laughs> and then when they buy that, then you put in all the funds. Yeah. I explain why that's, that's the case when all of the resources are expanding and the board it's a, it's a cool idea, but you've got a great point. You yeah, have, yeah. have a very short period of time. Yeah. And you have, your, you have your vision. I can go back to the vision if you want. Um, are you going to be able to deliver the experience of a Cold War with all of this stuff or with a, a smaller amount of stuff that you can get done in 15 minutes? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Yeah. Is it 10 minutes now? Okay. <laughs> you have 10 minutes. The essence, the essence is sense of urgency. The, uh, the experience is space race. Four players, symmetrical now. Uh, we have a yeah, countdown deck. Deck. I'm thinking, could it be so that we have the, the countdown until then, and on each sort of turn, so let's call them turns until the sort of game ends, each, each player draws a certain card from the spy decks, like uh, this guy suggested that are aggressive, you can use them to hinder the other person, and then you draw from another deck, which is you get resources to build your own uh, spaceship, so basically you can both attack the other players and you can also sort of build your own uh, spaceship. Well, I don't and then don't you mind. start getting, like, if one player starts to get a little bit further, the other, the other person are going to think, hmm, he's going to reach it, so then they're right. going to pile up on him with the aggressive cards to fucking... Here's, here's what I think. I think, I think that's great. Right. Here's what I think. The countdown deck has got events in it that move yeah. the timeline that, that, that we have that idea we talked about, they catch up. That this comes from the countdown deck as well. Not only is it countdown, but it also has you know, uh, mechanics to move things further. The spy deck is how you adjust the resource deck. Like uh, you draw cards that give you your resources, that's great. But if I have a spy card, I can take some of yours or etc. Yes. Very basic, keeping it very basic. So that's going to all work to our advantage of building a sense of urgency to a space race. But as Klaus said, where's the spaceship? Where's building the spaceship and all this? Um, we want to build a spaceship. It's really bad, and we have country bonuses. So maybe you know what? Maybe the board has got say what? Like we have the milestones, right? Yeah, milestones. Or so space parts space of our spaceships or yeah. steps in getting into space. When you think of the moon race, actually. Just make the spaceship have a number of uh, phases or steps. Sure. You have four phases, and it's big enough to go to the moon. With one phase, you can go just very rarely to orbit or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So your resource deck, your resource deck builds your milestones. Mm -hmm. Your spy deck adjusts the resources. The countdown deck adjusts catching people up. Mm -hmm. That's pretty simple. Yeah. That's a good start. Boom, 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 boom. We got spies. That's what I would say is a really super basic thing. Your spy token, we'd have to figure out how that works, unless we just want to keep the deck. Deck token, boss. You need to stop working on the game and start working on the presentation. Fair enough. <laughs> Decider, you think that's right? Yeah, well, I think that's right. Okay. So, in, in, in a game pitch, this is actually going back to the thing. Um, the first part, for a game pitch, you want to be able to tell people what? what What's it about? about? What is it about? You're going to want to be able to tell them what the experience should be, and you're going to want to give them an idea of the gameplay. Okay? And you should ideally do this in like two sentences. It's what's called the elevator pitch, and it comes from Hollywood, where you might have 20 seconds in an elevator with John Rogers to tell him about your great idea for a show about nurses in summertime. So you have 20 seconds, you know, tell them what you know. So two seconds, you should probably come up with two sentences that say, you know, all of these things that you can. You have seven minutes. <laughs> I really like, you added a lot of drama to this. <laughs> You're like, oh, hey, you know that sense of urgency I'm building in you right now? <laughs> That's our side of the game. <laughs> He's gaming us. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to eject another viewpoint. I want to play this game tomorrow. My friends, so, so that pitch doesn't matter. All right. Like, Get into that. So let's say uh, I'm going to suggest two sentences. Sentence one, sentence two. Uh, what does sentence one say? The game is about so high intensity the cool. um, multiplayer game about Cold War, Cold War space race. High intensity 
Organ. It's about building the, the, the spaceship that will win the space race. <laughs> Is that a board that we to fix? Well, we have a lot of board too. That's fine. <laughs> building a spaceship. To win, I like that, the space race. Decider, is that good enough, or do we want another one? I think that's quite good, actually. Okay, this guy's really easy to please. Yeah. <laughs> My handwriting is terrible. Okay. We have another sentence. What's the second sentence? What should it say? Like, it should be about kind of defending and, and defense of offense. Like, uh, in, in the Cold War global, global environment, your weapon is the spy and your shield is the scientist. Okay. Uh, espionage is a weapon. We don't, we're, we're not, we're not going to show you Mr. Scientist right now. Sure. Yeah. But I like espionage is our weapon. That's pretty good. Espionage is your weapon. And the moon is your goal. <laughs> yeah. 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 So are you supposed to talk about the gameplay? How do you communicate that? Are we supposed to say like, the espionage deck is your weapon. That's good. That's good. The espionage deck is your weapon. To be more specific about what is espionage. What else, what else can we say about the game mechanics here? Do we need to say it's four player? Do we need to say... No. Okay. Well I, well, I guess it's kind of kind of defining, or very defining by either winner or, you know, how many players. Yeah. That'll be on the box. So what, we'll yeah, on the for eight, eight to twelve. <laughs> 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 you can add that. <laughs> yeah. You can say that high intensity board game for four players about or high intensity competitive uh, board game. Yeah. But actually, do we need to limit ourselves into four players? Now that everybody is a different yeah, country. Yeah, you can play two to four. Yeah, yeah. 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 why it has to be exactly four? But so why, yeah. why, why is not two to six? I think why, why is a three or number of players? Yeah. 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 We don't get the fun. Do it's kind of it's kind of assuming that when you say board game, it's kind of assumed there's more than one player. Yeah. yeah. So well, you need two to play. Four High intensity and competitive board game about building spaceships to win the space race. The astronaut deck is your weapon. It's your goal. That's pretty good. What else can we say about the mechanics or the essence or the experience? Yes. We should come back to our the, the video or the vision and then formulate that. Into, uh, can we change the high intensity to refer to the first version? Like high intensity could be kind of more broad. Yeah. This is the addition. We originally said secret information, obviously that's different. <laughs> can I can I kill that inside? Yeah. Okay. How many darlings did we kill? Quite a few. Alright. Is this good or do we need to keep working on it? You need to say something about the sense of the urgency. Yeah. Like Where? It's like the, something that the, the game creates, like an urgency yeah. between the players or something like that. You could say it's a high Should stakes it? competitive board game. Should it be espionage is your weapon, the moon is your goal, time is your enemy? That's already removed. Yeah, I guess the, the moon has this nice pulpy 
so. To the moon. <laughs> to the moon exclamation point is the name of the game. <laughs> yeah, but there's right. already a game called to the moon. PC game. Is it called so, to is it Yeah, called? it's to the moon. Oh. Yeah. To the moon now. <laughs> <laughs> Race for the moon. Race for the moon. There's probably you know what? Just go with it. We don't have enough time. Yeah. Yeah. Race for the moon. A couple of minutes. We'll fix it in post. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, uh, the Mika Popular RP wrote it in a great roleplay game called uh, Virtue of and it was going to be uh, Heroes, of, Heroes of the Storm, but it was a wizard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that. I saw that, yeah. Tempest. I have a copy of that now. I'm so excited. It's for <laughs> Which one then? Age of the Tempest. <laughs> All right, so Super these, these six minutes for you guys, and uh, when we do the pitch to investors, it's mostly going to be over, so I just want to say thank you for letting me present my philosophy, and I really enjoyed building this game with you guys. <laughs> You're going to get thrown right into the shark tank. Here, God, he's back. Two minutes, and then I'm sending in the investors. Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> this this is our, our presenter right here. <laughs> Help keeping it up. Oh, Help to stay there. We go with this. Me, <laughs> me. The bottom, bottom, the bottom, the bottom, the bottom, the top, on the top there. Oh, there you go. <laughs> hmm. Good job, my buddy. Yeah. Very easy, please. I like that. <laughs> if you ever try to get something, I, I want to work for you. <laughs> Did I do a good job? Yeah. Yeah. So are we comfortable with how the rooms lay out, how people are sitting? Is there water available? <laughs> <laughs> there is water available. Yeah, backup information. Who answers tough questions? All that sort of stuff. Okay, who, who answers tough questions? Decide. Uh, <laughs> you answer tough questions. The guy with the red hair or the other yeah. shirt? No, you. The guy with the red hair? You. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> Not that no. guy, but that guy. Him? That guy. <laughs> you. you. He's talking to you. <clears throat> At you. No, no, no. No. First row. The first row guy. First okay. Row. Okay, he's talking to him. All right. So you're this telling me. This room is still the masterminds. I'm going to pitch that. Um, because this is a group effort. You know, a group of masterminds. The masterminds can answer. Okay. All right. Good deal. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> Just so you know, we're all counting on you. <laughs> One minute for final preparations. Decide, are you happy with everything? Uh, we could really use some props. Said, Do we have a moon base around? Do we have a moon base? That's the expansion. That's the expansion. That's a good idea. That's a good one. Second phase. So, oh, that's a good name for it, too, Bex. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a really Star Wars defense system. Okay, I'm bringing them in. Here they come. Dun dun dun! Excellent. Well, well, I'm from, directly from the board game industry, I would like to present to you Heiki <laughs> and Randa, who would like to hear our presentation. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> mm, um, what kind of marketer are you? 
targeting uh, history buffs who love the Cold War and uh, spy action. So what is the market size? The market size, well, how large is the, is the James Bond movie fan base? Uh, I guess we are easily looking at a couple of million people globally at least, and that's quite a good copy of this all. Euros piece, put by that with two million. <laughs> <laughs> So, which market are planning distributed? What's your uh, go-to? How do you plan to do distribution channels and grow? Well, that's what they're coming to you for. Yes, to do that, we of course need funding. We need to uh, we need to lease the production facilities. We're planning on uh, releasing on Amazon in order in order to tap into their distribution and distribution is it, uh, chain. Uh, after that, we distribute globally throughout Amazon. Amazon takes a cut, uh, we get the rest of the funding. We don't need to build a distribution channel of our own. Which, but which markets are you targeting? Do you have any other market? Uh, uh, I would guess this would automatically have a, uh, have a deep, have a lot of demand in the United States and in Russia because that we need to call more super hard in Saudi So you say when you enter the Russian market, are you making a Russian version? Of course, we'll trust it. So, what do you ask in our first time? We need to uh, upon the translate that we need, and we need to... Uh, there will be costs before we are able to because We need production costs, and we need translation costs. Yeah, and we need designers, huge large work, and... Uh, and how many of us can do? <laughs> <laughs> this is our first attempt at the game. So, roughly speaking, um, give me a ball figure what you need. Well, euros. 200,000 euros, and we will be able to uh, get a limited edition first release to the market, which will prove a viability. Then, in case it does well, we will be saying we use the profits and go up from there. So, what's your estimate market cap? When will it be back? How many of those 2 million people are you actually expect to reach? Um, we need at, uh, at least 6 months to produce all the boards, like get the designs, uh, take them to the factories, get them done, ship to the actual stores, and then we will have our breaking point roughly at 28,000 copies sold. After that, it's, it's all pure profit. So we need a 200,000 euros. Uh, we should be able to do it with 30,000 sold copies if we were paid. After that, it's really a cash flow question. We, in case you're interested, we will uh, send you a uh, cash flow calculator and excellent. So we are investors will need to leave because their next meeting is on. So they need to make the best decision. Can we have a fast decision? Is it a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Uh, you need to work more in the market. Sixty percent of up for me, then I would be at least this But in this. But otherwise, it's all yours. What about the concept? Is it thumbs up or down on the concept? Uh, I don't really know much about game gaming. <laughs> <laughs> what I would like to know is the return of the return of investment. Give us your return of investment, and we'll go for it. Not thirty percent. Oh, wait. <laughs> uh, we need to talk more. Okay. And have a discussion. Later. Well, thank you guys for coming.